in the night It whispered inside, said come with me You have something to see Make ready your heart It'll tear you apart But someone must know All these things I have to show I bid you look to the east See how its powers increased Yet with all that they have found They still burn it to the ground Behold the United States With its plentiful plates While starving mothers get burned Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you from Moriel TV and RTN TV. Thank you so much for joining us. First of all, to our regular viewers, I assure you, we are not backsliding into low tech once again. We're actually installing some new equipment to upgrade to make the high definition cameras better integrate with our computer system. And we're missing one component that will hopefully be coming this week. So for a day or two, we're back to semi-low tech, but we will resume the high tech in a few days. If you're wondering what has happened, that is it. Uh, Simply a consequence of upgrading. Be that as it may, looking at a subject that is not often addressed in the context it should be. So much of scripture, so much concerning end time prophecy and the return of Jesus relates those prophecies, what people call eschatology, to historical events, past, present, and future. We see this most acutely, of course, although not exclusively in the book of Daniel. But let me begin first with the book of Joel, the book of the Hebrew prophet Joel, chapter 2. Joel says something that was later borrowed by Peter the Apostle in his kerygma on the day of Pentecost, Hag Shavuot. In verse 28, it will come about after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, of course, we know from the book of Jeremiah and from the epistle to Timothy that old men could mean older in the faith, not necessarily older biologically or in any geriatric sense. Nonetheless, Peter borrows this on the day of Pentecost and his kerygma, the first evangelistic sermon ever preached by the church. And he says, this is like that in his kerygma. It says, it shall be in the last days, God declares, I'll pour forth my spirit on all mankind, on your sons and daughters, and they shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. We are warned in Colossians not to take a doctrinal stand on a dream or vision. That is how cults begin. The Lord shall be this, or God shall be that. And that becomes the basis to the doctrinal theology. In fact, Seventh-day Adventism comes from this. Not only that, but you have bogus dreams or bogus visions that are spuriously claimed. 
Islam, claiming that Muhammad met the angel Gabriel in a cave, or Joseph Smith with Moroni, or Ellen G. White, the founder of, of Seventh-day Adventism, claimed an angel appeared to her and pointed out the Sabbath from the Decalogue. We're warned against taking a doctrinal stand on anything of this nature. It is unscriptural, and it is potentially cultic or even cult-forming. Nonetheless, there is a place and a dream and a vision that God gives us. As long as what is communicated in it and through it is in agreement with the word of God and meets the biblical criteria. Like Mary in the nativity narrative, are all dreams not from God? We see at the first coming of Jesus, God spoke through dreams and visions, and he will do so again, but not to give doctrine. I've not had many experiences like this in my life as a believer, not many, only a few. One I did have, though, goes back nearly 40 years, nearly 40 years. And I was in a situation where I was living in Israel. I was not yet married. And I had a dream. And it was a kind of dream that I woke up and I was suspended in that kind of state between consciousness and unconsciousness. But I was quite conscious of what I had seen. And I felt the presence of the Lord. I didn't see Jesus. I didn't have him appear to me or tell me anything. It was just what we see in the book of Joel and in the book of Acts. I believe the Lord confirmed something to me that is in agreement with Scripture through this revelation I had in a dream. And I felt the presence of the Lord through the Holy Spirit when I woke up. And I knew the Lord was speaking to me. However, don't take my word for it. Such things must be tested. And it had a predictive element. Now, again, it was not the Doreen Virtue type thing that Chris Roseborough promotes and things like this and a Jesus who was never crucified appearing to me and uh, or like the uncrucified Jesus with no stigmata in the statue in Chris Roseborough's church that he stands in front of when he prays. It was not that kind of idolatry or superstition or anything of this nature. It was a revelation. It was the kind of dream that you see in Scripture, something I would never base doctrine on, but I would test with biblical doctrine. Now, I am a very, very moderate, charismatic, and I use the term sparingly a very moderate Pentecostal, and I use those terms for want of a better term. Let's just say I'm a non-cessationist, I'm a continuationist, but I don't believe in most of what we see in the charismatic movement where the Pentecostal movement is authentic. Some is, most is not. Nonetheless, I'll relate what I believe the Lord showed me. I was not the first one to say these things. Others had said it, or had said some of these things. The Lord showed me something happening in what was then the Soviet Union. Now, David Wilkerson had written a book some years earlier called The Vision, and he predicted that for a season a door would open in Russia for the preaching of the gospel. There were also some believers in the United States, Great Britain, and continental Europe who said there would be an exodus of Jews from the Soviet Union that would be very large. And it was prophesied by them at a time when the Russians were not letting any Jews leave. They were called refuseniks, refuseniks. My wife's family had been Romanian refuseniks, refuseniks, Jews who the communists prevented from coming to Israel on Aliyah, on immigration. It was not happening, but these believers in the States and in Britain and a few from continental Europe said it was going to happen, and they said there was going to be 
a disaster in the Soviet Union that was going to change everything quickly. And it was going to be God's judgment that it happened. This was before Chernobyl took place. And they said there would be an implosion of the Soviet Union. Now, this was the peak of the Cold War. This was the time of Star Wars and the confrontation with Ronald Reagan and so forth with Star Wars. This was before Perestroika and Glasnost, before Mr. Gorbachev came to power. And he did come to power shortly afterwards. It happened. What these believers said was going to happen did happen, and all these Jews came from Russia. What David Wilkerson said happened did happen. I was not the first one to say these things. I was not the only one to say these things. Anything that the Lord showed me in this regard was simply in harmony with what others had said first, and it was confirming of what they, they said. And they happen. That's the proof of the pudding from Deuteronomy 18, Jeremiah 23, and so forth. The things, Jeremiah 28 particularly, the things happened. They were not false prophets. They were true prophets. David Wilkerson called it right. Um, be that as it may, this is what the Lord then showed me. Now, I am not saying because of these things happened and were proven to have happened, that makes me a true prophet. I don't claim to be a prophet. Nobody in their right mind would want to be a prophet. I've never said I'm a prophet. However, if these things did not happen, it would certainly make me a false one. Let's understand. I don't say I'm a prophet, but if these things didn't happen, I'd have to be considered a false one. I saw something that showed a change would take place in Russia after the gospel had been preached for a while and after the Jews came out. And it would become inimical once again to the gospel. But it would become particularly dangerous to Israel and the Jews. Something was going to take place in the Middle East that Russia was going to be on back of or have a hand in. That is the Soviet Union as it was then. This again was before the Soviet Empire collapsed, before the CIS collapsed, before the Warsaw Pact collapsed. This was before Gorbachev. This was well before Putin. And I said, when this happens, it is going to put Israel and the Jews in such a state as they're going to fear another Holocaust type event, a potential extermination, threatening their extinction on the level of the Holocaust of the 1930s and 40s, in which one third of global Jewry and two thirds of European Jewry were exterminated by the Nazis. Something on that level was going to happen or of that kind was going to happen that was seriously going to threaten Israel. Now, I realized what the scripture said in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, <coughs> about Iran following the Iranian Revolution. I was in Israel when the Shah of Iran fell from power during the Carter administration. I was living at the time in Jerusalem. But what the Lord showed me was, it was going to be Russia who was on back of it. And it was going to be something that would scare the Jews of Israel, particularly, to death, remind them of the Holocaust. This didn't make a lot of sense at the time. Muslims conducted terrorist operations. They had various wars against Israel. When the Shah fell, Iran became extremely aggressively, militantly anti-Israel and played its hand successfully in uh, Lebanon through Hezbollah and to a degree in the Gaza Strip through Hamas and forged links on the basis of Shia Islam being a first cousin of the Alawite Islam of the Syrian regime of Assad. Actually, the Alawites are a form or a 
sect within Shia Islam. They're not Sunni. So this was happening. And you have to understand the politics of the Middle East among Arab nations and Iran, it's inextricable from, from religion. You can't separate the two in the mentality of the Middle East. It's sort of like Northern Ireland. You cannot separate the religion from the politics, only worse. Nonetheless, let's continue. Something was going to happen that was going to put believers inside Russia back in an unfavorable position. How unfavorable, I don't know, but it was also going to threaten the very existence of Israel, potentially putting Israel on a slab, but it was going to come from Russia. Now, automatically, this would bring to mind some kind of a Gog or Magog scenario. And we've done teachings about Gog and Magog uh, over the years. They're posted on RTN and on Moriel, where we discuss the three possible scenarios of Gog and Magog. One, it's synonymous with the Battle of Armageddon and what follows Armageddon, the, ba the, the battle in the, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, that it's the very end when the Lord comes. And there's reasons to believe that. You have a resurrection narrative in Ezekiel 37 with the flesh coming on the bones, and you have the armies of Gog and Magog coming to destroy Israel, and then divine intervention. And then it goes into the millennial description in chapter 40 of Ezekiel onward. Good arguments. Then there are those who say, although that may be true, it is not exclusively true. There can be, and some say will be, another Gog and Magog before the Battle of Armageddon. Most people, however, agree that even if there is or even if there is not two or three battles of Gog and Magog, the ultimate one, the final one, must be the one that takes place at the end of the millennial reign of Christ in Revelation chapter 20. The reason for that being, that's the one the New Testament mentions. The main Gog and Magog takes place after the millennial reign of Christ. Whether or not there is one or two that prefigure it, or that Revelation 20 is a Pesher interpretation of earlier events predicted in Scripture, these things are discussed, disputed. I simply mention it in passing for our purposes now. What was going to happen would be something like the Cuban Missile Crisis, I suppose, of my early youth. The eyes of America and the world were on Cuba and Castro and Havana. But what was really causing it was not Havana, it was Moscow. It was not Cuba, it was the Soviet Union. It was not Castro, it was Nikita Khrushchev and the Soviet Politburo. What was happening in the backyard of Florida was a reflection of something happening thousands of miles away in Russia during the Cold War. Something would take place in the Middle East that would be like that, that would remind the Jews of a Holocaust, of extinction, of extermination. And as we read in Ezekiel in the Gog and Magog prophecies, the intent of the nations is to destroy Israel and the Jews. And that's what the Iranians say their intention is. The mullahs are open about it. Khomeini is open about it. Ahmadinejad was open about it, etc. Well, my prophecy, as everyone knows, did happen. Again, that does not say that Jacob Prash is a prophet. It just says if it didn't happen, you should consider him a false one and keep away from him. We know what happened when Mr. Putin came to power. There was a crackdown on clergy visas and believers inside Russia, and I've spoken at congregations in Russia, in, in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. They don't have the same freedom they once did. 
Certainly evangelists and missionaries from abroad are not getting visas, but this is only the beginning. The Jews, however, did come out in the mass exodus, although some remain. Well, how did the prophecy come about? All you have to do is go on the Israeli news sites if you're not familiar with Israel and look at Haaretz or look at the Jerusalem Post website editorials in English or look at Yedidot Achronot or look at Debka or look at Israel World Today or any of these things. You'll see Israel lives in trepidation because of the threats of the Iranians to exterminate them. The Obama administration tried to buy time, giving $150 billion, as I've said many times, plus hundreds of million more secretly and probably illegally to the Iranian regime. Joseph Biden, now running for president, actually encouraged Western companies to invest in Iran. He was trying to buy their friendship and do so at the expense of Israel. Any inspections of the nuclear facilities in Iran had to take place after giving the Iranians 30 days warning. Now, when you understand the doctrines of Tahweed and the doctrines of uh, Hudna in Islam, where there's permissible lying, where they can say they mean peace, when they mean a ceasefire until they can get the advantage strategically, and they don't see this as lying. They see it as military disinformation given to the infidel and the jihad. Permissible lying. Oh, we believe in peace. We're going to abide by this. But they don't have to. Their religion tells them not to. At least their interpretation of their religion. So this was the situation. And this made Israel frantic. The last major foreign policy initiative of Barack Obama after his escapades against Israel with Hillary Clinton and with John Kerry and with Susan Rice was to pick up the telephone and call the prime ministers of Great Britain and of New Zealand and other countries friendly to the United States and urge them to vote against Israel in the UNESCO vote in the UN. The last thing Barack Obama did before leaving the White House in terms of foreign policy was to kick Israel in the teeth and try to set off a, a timer on a time bomb. That's what he did. Mr. Trump comes. We know what happens. Be that as it may, what is this fear Israel has? It is a fear shared by the Gulf states, even Saudi Arabia. What has made the Emirates make peace with Israel? Despite the aggravation and anger of Turkey, Iran, the so-called Palestinian Muslims, why they're afraid of Iran? Kuwait is leaning in the same direction. Although they're not forthcoming about it, there are many people in the House of Saud, the Saudi Arabian government, who, to save their own necks, in light of what has transpired in Yemen particularly, with the Houthis supported by Iran, they will make some kind of a compromise with Israel. No, look at the Israeli newspapers. Any week, you'll see articles and editorials about it any week on the op-ed pages. You'll see news commentators speaking about it on television at least one or two a week, sometimes daily. And you will see something else in the diplomatic initiatives. The last two times, the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Rosh Hashanah, addressed the United Nations. It was about Iran and the threat of Israel's extermination, which is compared to the Holocaust. He's only saying what Israelis typically say. 
people having conversations in a coffee shop or in a park. It's in the media. Academics speak of it. Diplomats and politicians speak of it. You can hear it virtually every day. There is a fear of something of the proportion of the Holocaust that can happen to Israel. But how does this figure, how does this come about? When Mr. Putin came to power after Mr. Yeltsin left, Mr. Putin was driven by his anger at having lost the Cold War. And among other things, he tried to reassert Russian position in the Middle East and also gain badly needed foreign exchange for Russia and create political and strategic instability in the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, in order to artificially drive up the barrel price of Russian oil and of Russian natural gas. These were his ambitions. This is what he was doing in his foreign and economic and defense policy. But Iran couldn't do anything except sponsor terrorism. Strategically, it couldn't do anything. Until the missile technology was provided by Russia for the Shahab 3 and then the Shahab 5, putting all of Israel, all of it, in range of Iranian ballistic missiles. All of it. The Iron Dome might intercept some American Patriot missiles and Israeli Arrow missiles, which operate as anti-ballistic missiles, may intercept some. But you only need a few to get in if they're carrying the right kind of warhead. What came next? It was the Russians, Russian nuclear scientists and engineers, who largely provided the technology to build the Iranian first nuclear reactor at Bushir. And as we speak, they're doing the same for the second one. The potential for Iran to have weapons-grade plutonium, uranium enrichment to weapons-grade fissionable material came from Russia. The Iranians couldn't do it any more than the Cubans could have done it in the Cuban Missile Crisis. It had to come from the Russians, from the Soviets. So to the Iranians, they couldn't do it. That missile technology came from Russia. That nuclear technology came primarily from Russia. There were some Western companies involved, but not like Russia. So Russia arms Iran with these missiles, and Russia is making it possible for the Iranians to enrich uranium to a weapons grade achieve critical mass in a military controlled explosion as a strategic weapon. They're known as tactical nuclear weapons, short range missiles, the Shahab-3, but more so the Shahab-5. The Shahab-3 are easier to intercept, the Shahab-5 are not. All courtesy of Mr. Putin of Moscow and of Russia. Just read the transcripts of the last speeches at the UN by Mr. Netanyahu. Go on to the English-Israeli news sites. There's a few that are in English. Watch what they're always talking about. Iran, Iran, the threat of extinction, of wiping out the state of Israel. You're talking about, once again, already, Six million Jews. 
There are now six million Jews in Israel. It is only if you count assimilated Jews and non-affiliated Jews does the United States still have slightly more. But in terms of practicing Jews or Jews with some kind of affiliation with a synagogue or a temple or a Jewish organization, Israel has overtaken the United States in terms of Jewish population who identify as Jews. Six million. Something else. The Iranian hand depleted uranium anti-tank weapons in the Gaza Strip, formerly controlled by Israel, but Israel gave up ostensibly for peace, now in the hands of Hamas, controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood. With the weapons, Iran. Where did the depleted uranium shells come from in terms of manufacture? Russia. The Katusha rockets, a Russian product, supersaturated Lebanon to attack Galilee, and they've done it three times. And they're preparing to do it again, apparently. You have Russian troops. A few kilometers from the Golan Heights. A few kilometers from the Israeli border are Russian military advisors to certain elements of the Syrian military and also Iranian-backed militias using Russian weapons. Shooting distance from Israel. As we speak, Mr. Netanyahu keeps meeting with Mr. Putin to try to discourage this. Doesn't matter. The threat has become very, very real. Israel fears another six million have their lives on the line. Just look at the last two speeches Benjamin Netanyahu gave at the UN and read his words carefully. Okay, so what I said was going to happen, happened. What other people said was going to happen also happened. But is there more happening? Is something else happening? The regathering of Israel. We have seen a regathering of the massive Jewish population from Russia and the Ukraine and the former Soviet Union. Massive. You can walk down the street in Netanya or in Tel Aviv or in the Kryot of Haifa and speak Russian. At one time in Israel, you had to speak Hebrew. English or Arabic. If you could speak one of those three languages, you could usually get by. In the earlier days of the state, Yiddish. Now, there are Russian neighborhoods, Russian speaking neighborhoods. There are Russian speaking congregations of Jewish believers. The Falashas came from Ethiopia. The Russian Jews and Ukrainian Jews came from the former Soviet. But where is the big immigration from now? Where is the big Aliyah from now? After the Holocaust, it was Holocaust survivors from Europe. Then it was a mass exodus of Sephardic Jews from North Africa and places like Iraq. Unfortunately, the educated and more affluent ones tended to go to France and some to Quebec. The poorer ones generally came to Israel from Morocco, Algiers, Tunisia, etc. 
but that's changing. The immigration trend in Israel now is those French Jews whose parents and grandparents left North Africa after the French Empire collapsed and after the Arab world, in a unified sense, became very hostile to Israel because of the rebirth of the Jewish state. They made lives for themselves in France. Not anymore. The growth of the Islamic population, the anti-Semitism, both the traditional French anti-Semitism and the radical Islamic anti-Semitism are seeing an exodus of Jews from France, the same as there was from Russia, same as there was from Ethiopia, same as there was from North Africa and Iraq, etc., etc. The question I propose is, is it possible that what is demographically still the largest Jewish community in the world, as a pop urban population center, New York still remains the single biggest, greater New York, not just New York City, but New Jersey and Long Island and so forth. Biggest Jewish urban population center is still New York, and the most Jews technically, ethnically, live in the United States, but not by much. Practicing Jews in a religious sense, or those who identify themselves as Jews, as opposed to having fully assimilated, there's now more in Israel than in America. About 45 to 48% of the world's Jewish population lives in Israel. Is something going to happen that'll make these Jews leave the United States? Let's understand something from the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is interesting because it's the only book of the Bible where we have all three original languages. There are actually some Greek words for musical instruments and things, but there's Hebrew and there's Aramaic. The introduction and prologue is in Hebrew, but from chapter 2, verse 4, and remember there's no chapter divisions in the original canon, it switches to Aramaic and continues in Aramaic until chapter 7, verse 28. The chapter divisions are not where the original languages would put them, as we have the chapter divisions in the Mesoretic and so forth. Why is this? Well, the answer is found of all places in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 10, verse 11, I'm convinced. There is one verse in Jeremiah 10, 11 that is not Hebrew, it is Aramaic. It looks out of place like a sore thumb, and it's in every existing manuscript that I know of. It's in Aramaic because it speaks of the gods of the nations to those nations. Aramaic, Chaldee was the lingua franca. Those portions of Daniel focused on Israel and the Jews are in Hebrew. Those portions of Daniel focused on Israel in its relationship to the Gentile nations are in Aramaic, the lingua franca. What is Judeo-centric is Hebrew. What is universal is Aramaic. Somehow, after verse 28 in chapter 7, everything begins to refocus on Israel. Now understand history from God's perspective. World War I had tremendous ramifications. Tremendous. It left the United States as the undisputable number one world power. That was the First World War. Britain and France were still around, but it was obvious America was number one after World War I. Secondly, it had implications for Europe that 
because of the Versailles Treaty, helped create the climate and economic conditions that gave rise to Adolf Hitler. Without the Versailles Treaty, there would not have been a lot of support for Hitler and the Nazis. It was the Versailles Treaty combined with the Great Depression at that particular time, the Wehrmacht in Germany, that caused Hitler to come to power. You had this season of class decadence uh, portrayed in the Liza Minnelli musical and film Cabaret, that kind of thing. And it, it happened. Out of this chaos arose Hitler, but the support for him came because of the economic ramifications of the Versailles Treaty. But something else happened for World War I. God sees it differently than we do. At the time, Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence, and General Allenby, and what happened in the Middle East fighting the Turks, that was seen as a sideshow. The main war was seen in Europe at the Sarn and the Somme and all these kind of things, and Bella Wood and so forth fighting the Kaiser. Fighting the Kirks and the Ottomans who were allied with the Kaiser, that was secondary. But not in the mind of God. That crushed the Ottoman Empire. That transformed the balance of power in the Middle East back into the hands of the West that was lost with Salah ad and the Crusades. Even Napoleon although he defeated the Mamelukes, could not get control of the Middle East, though he tried. Crusades were defeated at the Horns of Fatin, and that went on until the end of World War I. Following the military disaster at Gallipoli in Turkey at the Dardanelles that left Winston Churchill discredited for a while, the ANZUS forces, the Australians and the New Zealand troops were very, very angry at the Turks. And they took their vengeance in the battle at Beersheba in Israel. The Australians and the Kiwis, the Aussies and the Kiwis, obliterated the Turks in a revenge attack almost for what happened in the Dardanelles. So decisive was their victory that the Turks weren't really going to fight much anymore. And something else is reported to have happened. They had never seen airplanes. So when British reconnaissance planes overflew Jerusalem, they were scared. General Allenby came into Jerusalem through Jaffa Gate unopposed. The Belfour Declaration opened the door for Aliyah, although the British would later revoke it. In God's economy, the bottom line of World War I was the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the opening of the door for Aliyah to become a Jewish state. This climaxes with the San Remo agreements that everybody wants to forget and sweep under the table and call Israel an occupying power, when in fact the San Remo agreements of the League of Nations that the United Nations is the successor of, gave that land to Israel. Separate but related subject, let's move on. In God's economy, something else happens at the end of the Second World War. The Versailles Treaty causes support for Hitler. Comes to power. The after effect of the First World War was devastating. More troops were killed in World War I than World War II. It was the civilian casualties. It was the Blitz in England and the Holocaust on the continent that made World War II worse than World War I in terms of human lives lost. But military lives lost, nothing came close to World War I up to that time and even World War II was not quite as bad. Nonetheless, we move on further. 
there was this hope that by having the United States of Europe, you would never have another World War I or World War II. It created the impetus to establish at the Treaty of Rome with the blessings of the papacy, what became the common market now called the European Union, which I have no doubt, no doubt, is at least the embryo of what Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 2, as I've stated many times. That was one result of World War II, a prophetic significance dealing with Daniel. But the other was the United Nations establishing Israel as a Jewish state. Despite the efforts of the British government to block it, despite the objections of the Arab world, it was reborn. International sympathy, and particularly sympathy in the United States because of the Holocaust, resulted in pressure on the Truman administration to support the UN vote for petition. The Russians also had some kind of ambition in it because the founders of Zionism were socialists. In fact, the kibbutzes were essentially communists, not in the Soviet sense of communists, but they were collectives. They were communistic collectives. One of the reasons the Soviets came to hate the Israelis is the Israelis had a form of communism that was generally egalitarian and gave people a high standard of living, but it was not a socialist economy. It was a mixed economy. There was also free enterprise and so forth. With the Moshavs being a combination of socialism and capitalism in the Moshav movement. So it was a mixed economy, but the Russians had ambitions. Didn't last long. With Nasser, they became the enemies of Israel and worked to destroy it by arming the Arab nations, particularly Syria and Egypt under Nasser, which continued until Anwar Sadat. I digress. Stalin came to power when Lenin died. Stalin murdered Trotsky, a Jew, had the KGB assassinate him in Mexico. Stalin murdered Zinoviev. He began expelling Jews from the Communist Party, even though many founding members of the Communist Party in Russia were Jewish. Despite the fact that Marx was an ethnic Jew, they didn't care. Stalin redefined Russian communism as Sovietism. It was, in fact, a combination of an elitist socialism with a ruling elite, the Apartheid, the Politburo, <clears throat> and the party, and the party apparatus, who basically were the new czars. They simply replaced the czars with themselves, but behaved like the czars and even worse. And Stalin combined this with Russian nationalism. He hated the Ukrainians, he hated the Lithuanians. He killed more Soviet citizens than Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. I remember reading the book, The Gulag Archipelago, when I was a young guy by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and I was absolutely shocked. I never fully understood Sovietism before that time. To meet export quotas, he would starve millions of his own people by taking the grain harvest from the steppes and exporting it for foreign exchange. Unbelievable cruelty. But he was anti-Semitic. The Jews who hoped to establish a socialism in Russia against the pogroms they suffered under the czars realized what happened, and they came to Israel, or began to come to Israel, to make a Jewish form of socialism that, as Ben-Gurion would later say, would be a light to the nations. Now, the light to the nations was supposed to be that they were witnesses for the Messiah and had the word of God, but this concept from the Hebrew scriptures was replaced by a Zionist ideology, a secular Zionist ideology. Once more, I slightly digress. 
So, had it not been for Hitler and Stalin, there would be no Israel. God allows evil for his purposes. Even the victories of Satan backfire on him, and when God allows bad things to happen, ultimately they happen in accordance with his purposes. He allowed the rise of Babylon to have it destroyed by Persia. And under King Cyrus, Kirush, and Darius the Mede, the Persians blessed Israel. The Lord is the Lord of history. As we pointed out on various Bible studies in the past, the Lordship of history that has always been God's will be given into the hand of the Antichrist and false prophet, that is Satan, for two times a time and a half time. Jesus had three and a half years of public ministry. Satan will demand and receive equal time within certain parameters, within certain parameters. Like with Job, God says this far, no further, this long, no longer. But something terrible is going to happen that will be unique, unique in its infamy at the close of the age. And we're drawing closer to it. So we see what came out of World War I and World War II, the rebirth of Israel. This was God's hand. This was the main result of these things. The rise of the EU was the main result of these things, fulfilling the prophecies of Daniel 2. But what's happening now? I've spoken about, on our podcast, This Week in Prophecy, how the left of today, these people who are rioting in the United States, particularly, but there are expressions of it in Britain, Europe, and elsewhere, how it is not, in any sense, the left of yesteryear, of the 1960s. In the 1960s, I myself was a radical socialist. It was a time of tremendous social upheaval and injustice. Young black guys were being drafted and sent to Vietnam. Coming back from Vietnam, wanting to get an education on the GI Bill and being told in Alabama and Mississippi they couldn't get a university education because they were black after they fought for freedom, supposedly. These things got my generation angry. Very angry. And that was just one of the examples of what was wrong. A completely unconstitutional war in Vietnam. Congress shall have the right to declare war. The real conservatives at that time, led by Barry Goldwater, realized you were sending these troops with their hands tied. Declare war and get it over with. But no, they wouldn't declare war. They prolonged the war, and while the war was prolonged, the Johnson administration, followed by the Nixon administration with Kissinger, opened a taunt with Russia and China, increasing trade with Russia and China while Russia and China were arming North Vietnam to kill Americans. It was just business. Open corruption in the White House. Just open corporate corruption owning the Nixon and Johnson administrations. And then young people being drafted and being told they had to go fight this. They had no vote at the time. The voting age was not yet 18. They could just be drafted, drafted and have to go. And if they didn't go, they were told they were cowards or they were communist sympathizers. You have to go fight in Vietnam with your hands tied behind your back so we can trade with the communists. <laughs> Unbelievable. Ships of America's allies, Japan, Great Britain, Canada, we're in Haiphong Harbor. It was all a sham, the CIA trafficking and heroin, etc. Complete and utter corruption. A corrupt White House, a corrupt Pentagon, a corrupt CIA, total corruption. 
and a deep institutionalized racism in the American South. This drove my generation to the left. Naively, but understandably. But it was a different kind of left. It was not the left you see today. The left then began in Berkeley, California, is the usual landmark people would point to, with the free speech movement, the University of Berkeley, the free speech movement. They were pro-free speech. They wanted to be able to criticize the government as the Constitution says they should. Students wanted to speak out, protest. The free speech movement. Free speech was sequestered on campuses and elsewhere. The left of today, however, is not pro-free speech. It is anti-free speech. If there are those who are supportive of Israel or those who are supportive of the free market or those who are supportive of Donald Trump, they don't have the right to put their views across. And an increased number of students say violent protest is justified to stop free speech. So the traditional left was pro-free speech, the new left as anti-free speech. The original left of my youth were the victims of McCarthyism. It was the establishment, the right center establishment Republican Party who were the McCarthyists. You were a Russian spy, you, you, you're colluding with Russia, they went witch hunting in Hollywood and things like this. The old left was against McCarthyism. In, in fact, to a degree, they were victims of it. It was perpetrated by the alcoholic senator, nice Irish Catholic boy, Joe McCarthy. My mother's family is Irish, by the way. I'm not anti-Irish. And his general counsel, Roy Cohen, who died of AIDS, a homosexual Jewish lawyer from New York, and uh, my family, my wife and kids are Jewish. I'm not against Jewish people. But I didn't like Cohen, and I didn't like McCarthy. The left was anti-McCarthyism. Today, <clears throat> the left are the McCarthyists. Russian collusion, Putin controls Trump, KGB controls this, they used to say the KGB was infiltrating Hollywood. Now they say the Russian government was controlling the Trump administration. It's McCarthyism. No evidence. There's never any real evidence, much less proof in McCarthyism. It's just witch hunting. Politically motivated witch hunting. Run by disgusting people like Roy Cohen and Joe McCarthy. Today, it's run by disgusting people like Adam Schiff, Jerry Nadler, McCabe, Brenner, Clapper, Susan Rice, Strzok, Page. <laughs> Holmby, the usual deep state cast of characters that we hear about that are under investigation now by an independent prosecutor. The left was against McCarthyism. Today, the left are the McCarthyists. The old left was anti-racist. We wanted people to be considered as individuals. Martin Luther King said, we will judge men by the content of their character not the color of their skin, treat everybody equally. And Martin Luther King stood up for Hispanics, for Native American Indian tribes, for poor whites in Appalachia. It was not about race to him. It was about justice. Additionally, he was governed by Christian principles, broadly speaking. I'm not saying he was a believer, but he also 
warned in his speeches about Russia and China as being undemocratic. And he was a man of peace, and he was a supporter of Israel who warned that anti-Zionism is simply the current expression of anti-Semitism. This is Martin Luther King. He was anti-racist. Today, the left is racist. Black lives matter! No, all lives matter, including black lives. But while black lives matter to decent people, black lives don't matter to black lives matter. The murder rates of blacks killing blacks in Chicago and New York and Baltimore and Philadelphia have gone through the roof. Most of the victims are black people, black children going to school being shot dead, and Black Lives Matter don't say a word unless a renegade policeman shoots a black person or even in a justifiable shooting. That becomes the big crime. They don't care about black lives. They're just playing the race card to get power. Additionally, because of affirmative action, qualified and intelligent blacks, of which there are many, and of which there would be many more if we did not have a failed public school system, are insulted and stigmatized. They're telling black people, you're not good enough to make it. We have to give you extra points. We have to let you into Yale University above Asians and white people who are more qualified. Suppose a basketball franchise like the Lakers or the Knicks said, we don't have enough diversity. We have too many blacks. We have to have more Asians and more Hispanics and more Caucasians. And we're going to give contracts to people who are Caucasian and Asian and Hispanic and Native American Indians and f fewer to blacks. Would that make any sense? No. Would it be fair? No. But that's exactly what they're doing. And what an insult to the intelligent blacks who don't need that garbage. Believe me, I know some black people who are as smart as any white person, some smarter. You want to hear a smart black? Listen to Dr. Thomas Sowell. Listen to Professor Walter Williams. Listen to Candace Owen. Listen to Larry Elder. Listen to, you know, Dr. Alan Keyes. Some of the smartest people in the United States are black. Dr. Ben Carson, greatest pediatric brain surgeon in the world. Only one to successfully separate encephaloflagellous Siamese twins. Brilliant. Herman Kang was a rocket scientist turned successful businessman. But somehow, because of the left, they don't like the smart blacks. They like the stupid ones. They like the Al Sharptons. And so they discriminate against other minorities. Asians are openly discriminated against by major universities. Even though their math scores are so high and their SAT scores are so high, they're discriminated against for admission to allow in less qualified blacks when in fact we'd have a lot more qualified blacks if we had a decent school system instead of the joke we have now. But let's look. The old left were anti-racist. The new left are racist. The old left were anti-segregation. I remember Jim Crow. I remember going to Florida for vacation with my parents when I was a little kid. And I remember going to the American South, the Carolinas and Georgia, even Virginia. White only. I couldn't believe it. I remember that, white only. The left was against this. 
They were against segregation. Now, they want black-only space. <laughs> they want gay and lesbian and transgender-only spaces because they feel threatened by whiteness. Oprah Winfrey, you've got to take your whiteness with you. That's what she said. Can you imagine somebody saying to a black person, you've got to take your blackness with you wherever you go? They'd be de defined as a racist, and rightly so, they'd be labeled the racist. Well, an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. Oprah Winfrey is plainly a racist, by her own words. The old left were anti-racist. The new left are racist. The old left was anti-segregation. The new left are segregationists. The old left had a radical element. It had radical elements, like the Black Panther Party and the Weather Underground it had campus radicals. It had a radical element. But it was predominantly nonviolent. Martin Luther King denounced violence. He was influenced by people like Mahatma Gandhi and, and Christian principles and things like this. He was anti-violence. You had the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. The protesters were hippies. They were known as peaceniks. They were singing John Lennon songs, give peace a chance and all you need is love. John Lennon said, violence begets violence. Martin Luther King denounced the violence. They were against these things. Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. <clears throat> the violent radicals were in the minority. Now in the new left, the violent radicals are in control. They're not peaceniks. They're not like the traditional left. In the traditional left, the traditional left was against the Democratic Party. It had been the party of slavery and was at that time, in my lifetime, the party of Jim Crow. Segregation in the American South. The left fought the Democratic Party. They protested Lyndon Johnson out of the White House. The Chicago 8 at the Democratic Convention with Daley and the Cook County Democratic Machine who staged a police riot against the protesters. And then the, obviously the famous conspiracy trial with Abby Hoffman and Bobby Seale and those people. Unbelievable. The left were against the Democratic Party. Now the left are the Democratic Party. The old left were against the corruption of some of the rich or of the rich generally. They were against it. These corporate profiteers who were trading with the communists at the same time they were supplying the American military to fight the communists? Well, American sons and brothers and fathers were coming home in body bags. They were trading with the communists. Country Joe and the Fish, Country Joe McDonald and Woodstock. Let's hope and pray when they drop the bomb, they drop it on the Viet Cong. Come on, Wall Street, don't be slow. Man, this is war, so go, go, go. Plenty of good money to be made, supplying the army with the tools of the trade. The left of my era, the traditional left, protested the corporate aristocracy. Today, the Silicon Valley clique, the social media Robert Barons, George Soros, etc., fund it. 
They're elitists. They know they can control it the way that the Politburo and a part cheek control the Soviet Union. The rich fund it. The left used to fight the corporate aristocracy. Now they're funded by it. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Chris Rock, the comedian, said that Barack Obama represented favorable change, words to that effect, for white people. <laughs> this is Chris Rock, an Afro-American comedian. He's sort of like the Lenny Bruce of, of, of the black community. He uses comedy as a form of social commentary. Oh, the Obama administration was nationally transformed for white people. He's right. Under Barack Obama, after two terms, the average Afro-American family's income after eight years of Obama decreased by $900. It decreased by $1,000, increased by $1,000 in the first 11 months of Donald Trump. Record black unemployment under Obama that was persistent, particularly among blacks under the age of 25, astronomically high employment under Donald Trump. Yet they call him the racist. Now, uh, Malcolm X, no matter what you think of him, and he was a mixed bag, Malcolm X said the worst thing that can happen to black Americans is white liberals. The worst thing that can happen to black Americans is white liberals. On that point, Malcolm X was right. Chris Rock was right. Three strikes and you're out. The Clinton administration, supported by Joe Biden, tripled the amount of black men in prison and black women. It was Donald Trump who brought about the prison reform. It was the vice presidential candidate, Harris, who as state attorney general in California, imprisoned incredible numbers of black men for petty crimes. Yet black people think she's wonderful and they're going to vote for her. They voted for her for senator in California. And many blacks she put in jail doesn't matter. Now, the old left was not like this. They had perhaps a misguided reasoning, but they reasoned. They weren't completely stupid like what you have today. The old left had a high view of Jesus and Christianity in some sense. I don't say Martin Luther King was a born-again Christian or a conservative evangelical, but he was guided, broadly speaking, as a Baptist clergyman by New Testament moral principles of nonviolence and justice. He was a Baptist minister. So, too, I remember the posters when I was a young guy. Jesus was the first hippie. He had long hair and taught about love and peace and so forth. There was a positive view of Jesus and Christianity in some sense by the old left. And in fact, the Jesus movement, the last major revival in the United States from where Calvary chapels, Jews for Jesus, and these things came out of it, was a revival among these hippies who'd been leftists. Today, the left is anti-Christian. Extremely anti-Christian. And getting worse. Hatred of Christ and of, Christian, and of Christian values. 
No, the left today is not the left of my youth. It is not the left of yesterday. They were against the Democrats. Now they are the Democrats. They were against the corporate aristocracy. Now they're funded by them. They were against McCarthyism. Now they are the McCarthyists. They were against violence. Now they are violent. They were against segregation. Now they are segregationists. They were against racism. Now they are racists, et cetera, et cetera. It's a different kind of left. Well, what kind of left is it? What kind of left do we see taking place? When you have this kind of social chaos, it always reminds me of what happened with Ballat and Robespierre in the French Revolution. The maddened crowds who begin singing and chanting liberty, fraternity, and equality get out of control and become so violent they turn against their own camaraderie. Now there's left-wing politicians who were sympathetic to Antifa and Black Lives Matter being attacked on the west coast of the United States. The mayor of Seattle. The very left-wing politicians who pandered to these people are now under siege by them in some cases. When you have that kind of chaos, they turn against their own leaders as they did Robespierre and Balat. And of course, ultimately, if this goes on, what you see is a Napoleon, somebody who will restore social order by dictatorial means. It was quite a thing. Now, the court of Louis XIV and all this was corrupt, and Cardinal Richelieu was corrupt. It was all corrupt. But the peasants in France were still better off than the peasants in most of the rest of Europe. Marie Antoinette was not even French. She was an Austrian from the House of Habsburg, married into the royal family of France to cement the political alliance, as was the practice in those times. The first lady was not even French when the revolution happened. Sound familiar? Vive la République, liberté, fraternité. Oh, yeah. Vive la Revolution. Look what happened. The Napoleonic Wars. Well, what came next? No, the left today are more like the Bolsheviks. Decadent and stupid. Being manipulated by an elitist cater of professional political con artists who are using them for their own purposes. Just look at it. The governor of Illinois was pushing the crackdown and the quarantine. When asked why his own wife was allowed to go to the airport and get on a plane and go to Florida, he said, you're attacking my family. <laughs> the governor of Illinois, the mayor of Chicago, Lightfoot, the lesbian mayor of Chicago, she goes and gets her hair done. And they say, why are you doing this? It violates the quarantine. And she says, I'm the mayor. I'm the face of Chicago. I can do what I want. Michelle Obama gives a speech on the radio urging people to observe the quarantine, not to go out unless they have to. As she was speaking, her husband, Barack Obama, was in a limousine paid for by the American taxpayers, escorted by federal police to a golf course in Virginia to play golf. Nobody else. One rule for Lightfoot, another rule for the people of Chicago. One rule for Lightfoot and one rule for Obama. Then we see Feinstein getting your hair done and not wearing a mask. These are the elitists. This is Bolshevism. 
controlled media, Pravda and Izvestia. The news was not what transpired. The news was not something you report. The news was something you politicize and use as propaganda in the Soviet Bolshevik system. Today, it's called CNN, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the BBC, MSNBC, some say the Washington Compost, MSNBC. BBC is biased, blasphemy, and cowardice. CNN is the Clinton News Network, and the New York Slimes, the Washington Compost, etc. Fake news like it's Vestia and Pravda. No, these are not the traditional American left. What really scares me is they resemble another kind of socialist. Ignorant people. don't understand essential reality sometimes. The predecessor to the Antifa movement was Occupy Wall Street. And they were out protesting banks. The Federal Reserve was lending banks money at zero interest. The banks were lending the money out at 4 to 5% interest. That was provided by the Federal Reserve. They were protesting. This was done under the Obama administration. They thought they were protesting capitalism. They were too stupid to know that federal bailouts of banks and what the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury were doing under Obama. That was not capitalism, that was socialism, but again, they were too ignorant to know it. They thought they were protesting capitalism. And many of them were students, university students. You would think they wouldn't be so thick. But let's continue. The other kind of socialism were the Nazis. The Nazis were socialists. The National Socialist Workers Party. Nazis were socialists. Like Antifa, Black Lives Matter, violent. Like Antifa, Black Lives Matter, racist, bigoted. Like Antifa and Black Lives Matter, anti-Semitic. You can look at some of the anti-Semitic statements made by some of the leaders of Antifa and Black Lives Matter. The Nazis burned public buildings like the Reichstag. These Antifa and Black Lives Matter socialists are burning public buildings in Seattle, in Portland. They're doing the same thing as the Nazis. Because of the Depression, combined with the Versailles Treaty, a political environment was constructed that facilitated the rise of Hitler that wouldn't have happened otherwise. The Centrum, the Catholic Party of Bavaria, led by Franz von Papen, who'd been a terrorist in World War I and attacked a target in New York Harbor called the Black Tom in the First World War, was the leader of the Centrum. The Catholic Party of Bavaria that made a coalition with Adolf Hitler's Nazis with the blessings of the Vatican. And it's brought Hitler to power. Von Papen was sentenced 
at Nuremberg to eight years in prison. They didn't hang him because Pius XII, the Pope, intervened politically. Nonetheless, you have the left today wanting to take China's gift to the world, the coronavirus, and politically exploit it to bring about economic depression so the voters will blame Donald Trump and they can regain power. Had you not had this economically depressed state, Hitler wouldn't have gotten power. They're playing the same game. They're burning public buildings. They want controlled media. They don't want free speech. Not only that, but the rank stupidity. Hitler was not the only fascist. The Peronists in Argentina, the Vichy French, Mussolini in Italy, Franco in Spain, the Falangos in Lebanon, there were many fascists. Hitler just took it to its natural conclusions. That's all. His socialist conclusions. The brown shirts and the people who followed Hitler initially, who burned the public buildings, who were the iconoclast, who were the bigots, they were too stupid to know that socialism didn't work. All they had to do was look east to Stalin, to the Soviet Union, and realize socialism doesn't work. Why Hitler and Stalin hated each other, I do not really know because they were two of a kind. They were both socialists. They were both radical Darwinists. They were both racists. And they even made a deal with each other that Hitler broke. They were two of a kind. We hate the communists. They're only socialists like you, violent socialists. The brown shirts and the followers of Hitler didn't have the brains to realize socialism doesn't work. Just look at Stalin. Look at the legacy of Lenin. Look at the Soviet Union. Today, it's the same. They're too stupid. Look at Cuba. Look at Venezuela. Look at what was left of Eastern Europe when the Warsaw Pact collapsed. Just look. It doesn't work. When I was a teenager, I was a socialist. But there was one major problem with it. It does not work. It has never worked. But they're too stupid to know it. Just like the followers of Hitler. And in Hitler's day, he came to power by getting a weak leader who was aging, who they knew wouldn't last. They got Hindenburg, von Hindenburg. Once von Hindenburg went, Hitler walked into power perfectly legally, even supposedly democratically. Now they get an aged, inept leader, Joseph Biden, who they pushed in to keep Bernie Sanders out. And they know he can't last to do anything. He's half senile. This is exactly what the Nazis did. And that's exactly what these neo-Nazis are doing today. The present left resemble the French Revolution, and they resemble the Bolsheviks, and they resemble the Nazis. They do not resemble the traditional left, not in any sense. Not in any sense. What if these people get power? We saw a foretaste of what happened when Obama was there, when he tried to give Iran the upper hand to destroy Israel, when he allowed 
radical Muslims into the country. He, his administration gave visas to those people who murdered the people in a terrorist attack in San Bernardino, California. That was Obama and Clinton and Kerry, and they were not held accountable. We saw how Obama tried to throw Israel under the bus and campaigned against Israel covertly in the UNESCO vote. That's only a little taste of what these people will do. And the stupidity, the stupidity. One of the things that characterized German Jewry was they were so naive. Oh, look how many intellectuals were German. Einstein was a German Jew. And, you know, all of these people, Steinmetz was a German Jew. And the Jewish scientists and the Jewish intellectuals were German Jews. And they were loyal to the Kaiser and the First World War and things like this. Freud, a German Jew. All of these people were German Jews. It won't happen here. Germany can't turn into an anti-Semitic country. And they were stupid. Well, American Jews are no less naive and stupid. Two-thirds of them are naive people. They will vote Democrat. They may as well pay their own airfare to Auschwitz, as I've been saying. They'll, they'll buy their own train ticket to the concentration camp. That's what they're doing. Remember, Hindenburg got in as a foolish, incompetent, aging person. They knew when he got in, he wouldn't last. A radical got in. Same with Biden. What will they do? Can this bring about circumstances where what's happened in Russia, what's happened in Ethiopia, what happened in North Africa with the collapse of the French Empire, what happened in Russia, what happened in France, will that happen in the United States? That there'll be an exodus of American Jews into Israel as a result of these Nazis coming to power. Remember, the Nazis were socialists. Can this happen? In many respects, it already is happening. I pray to God that he will stop it. I pray to God that he will stop it. But I'm convinced only the hand of God can stop it. Please pray. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening.